Hello, I'm Johnny Tucker, editor of Blueprint, and welcome to the Blueprint Innovation Interviews at ARPA. We have four interviews for you, and we'll be talking about the essential nature of innovation and what it does for architecture and practice. Yeah, innovation means for me um, um, changing boundaries, uh, changing maybe some ideas in your field where you're good in. Maybe don't don't invent the new because that's difficult to invent every day the new, but to change maybe certain parts within the profession in such a way that you maybe in the end after a few de decades or after, after a particular time that you then come up with a new idea. I think that as an architect you need to think not only about the design you're uh, making for the client you're working, you should I think also think more about the practice. If there is a way that you can um, think about health and the environment in the office environment. For instance, I introduced in an uh, office building once air condition systems whereby uh, the air is now so good. It was used also in hospitals, in the operation room especially, where air doesn't circulate from one person to the other. We could reduce down close to 20% of uh, the building sickness. Uh, so innovation can happen on the smaller scale, it can happen on the scale of things you don't see. Uh, but might be very healthy for the people who work there, for instance. We uh, believe in knowledge sharing, uh, also in the way how we store knowledge and set it up for that uh, knowledge platform. So there are three knowledge platforms, or four actually uh, now, uh, in the office, and they all deal with uh, yeah, the sustainable, new materials, uh, the way how we rethink organizational principles, in the way how we design buildings. Um, yeah, and, and, and actually what is quite important is that we uh, set it up a system for the new members of the architects coming in the studio that they are the first half year uh, in a platform and that they can do only pure research. And with that research, if they've done that in, for instance, the material platform, that they then can move um, maybe later on to another platform so that over the years that they can uh, get an all-round education in, in, the, in the way how we work. So sometimes it might happen that you have in the building on several floors uh, uh, two uh, uh, projects uh, happen happening simultaneously. A collaboration with external advisors, with people we love to work with, and whereby we can set up a kind of form of co-creation is important. But we do that also in the office to make sure that all the different members of the different projects um, don't talk parallel next to each other, but they listen and learn from each other. Uh, technology is very important. I mean, we believe that every tool that, that it can help you to uh, further develop uh, design. But of course, I mean, the most important is that you stay clean and clear to its imagination and that you uh, constantly uh, keep on thinking about the possibilities of what you can do within architecture, so, so, so that you keep working on the tactile side as well. We do make models, we sketch a lot, but in the same time, um, I have already uh, programmers in the office who can help me with scripting such uh, complex programs for the way how projects need to be now, for instance, very quickly built and that you communicate with the 3D models um, to all your subcontractors in one day if there is one problem or something like that and can mail them the 3D model what is corrected in the same day back. So, so we, we, we believe in technology there where it can support uh, the imagination and can hopefully, possibly there, also introduce new type of spatial effects. So the intelligence of the technology right now, the Internet of Things, is another discussion we lately have. So it's not only anymore about form and geometry and the way how we can set up 3D models, but also particularly now how we can make architecture more interactive. And that is, of course, a whole new phenomenon where architecture is very slow with, uh, we think. The Einem train station was originally uh, planned to be only a station. But then when we talked to the city and actually the rail people from Holland, then we discovered that it needed to be a transfer location with two bus stations, a parking, a bicycle parking, 
So all these different uh, layers of uh, infrastructure elements needed to be become a transfer hub. And that gave us the opportunity to make a an, an transfer strategy for everything also around the station. You know that most of the stations in Europe they have a tendency to become the backyards of uh, the city. And here the city wanted to reprofile themselves and stimulate public transport by intensifying also the, the program on the rail side. So on a 40,000 square meter side, we introduced close to 150,000 square meters uh, to, to create that liveliness on the location. And it's all visible and, and, and that was the aim, to make an architecture what is interactive, what is uh, exchangeable between the public and how you walk through the building so that you could, through the architecture, find your way. So all that information and deep research, um, we select through there where the information doesn't uh, work in the right manner in, in a project. Maybe you've heard of this idea, what we've lately developed in projects, of the bigger detail in the project. So we call it the design models. And um, you could, for instance, in the Arnhem train station, think of the V walls who are carried through five program layers. We did that in order to make sure that all the different programs wouldn't have their own column system, but that we could, with all these program layers, introduce one constructive system. So that was one big detail. And then there was the twist as another detail. But how we came to these details was by constantly coming back to what are then the three elements or the four elements who are making this project work. And, and yeah, actually through simple design sessions, like maybe uh, we went through m more than 40 <laughs> because Arnhem took a long time. All these design sessions gave us then the chance to select the information. And that is just simply introduced, not digitally alone, but it's particularly introduced by the way how we think things work and spatially operate the best. Well, I am interested in parametrics uh, in architecture, but, but we started with it already quite early, I think maybe already so 15, 20 years ago. And, um, and we believed that it was important to group information together on a location, like we looked at user groups on the site, even what the user groups for infrastructure used, and even the political background sometimes. And then we connected it to its public spaces, or um, either to think of um, how these user groups would use the location in time. But, but I've learned that if you co cross combine uh, digital information and you just let it self-organize itself by, by self-organizing forms, then, then you, um, yeah, you need to develop a certain form of discipline in that. You need to f develop a certain form of control or a concept of control. You know, the nice thing about the digital is that it can cross-combine information so that sometimes it can find its own way in the form you're making or an organization you're making. But you still have to discipline it and organize it and you have to, um, you have to find a way to develop new concepts of control. That's why I believe in. And, and, the, and the design models do that the best because they are kind of editors in the design process of, of selecting all these layers of information. So you need an editing process, you need to gu a guiding process of the design and a disciplinary aspect what can make the parametric a bit more fascinating and also more um, yeah, more, more, more understanding for the way how it can, uh, yeah, can be then useful for design. 